how are you all doing? How is, <laughs> how is everyone? This is my third take, actually. I'm walking backwards because the sun's there. So if I turn around and film this way, which is the way I'm walking, you'll see what happens to the image. So it's not good. So I walk backwards along this fantastic street here in West London. We're in Gunnersbury, right over west. It's a bit of a special walk for me personally today because we're going to walk the first section of the first walk in my book this other London and we're going to start from Gunnersbury, Gunnersbury Park, Gunnersbury House and we're going to go west along the Golden Mile, London's Golden Mile. There's so many incredible buildings and great stories on that road and then we'll see how we're doing for daylight. We're going to go up to a place called Wick Green which has got amazing stories as well and then round the edge of Ostley Park and possibly finish at Heston. Who knows where we'll finish but there's so much on this walk today and I'm so excited because like I say this was the first lines, the first pages of my first book, This Other London, and I haven't been back down here since then, which was 10 years ago. And I wanted to come this way because of these really wonderful industrial buildings here, which I guess are from the first half of the 20th century. I wouldn't like want to put an exact date on them, but they're really magnificent, and you get these small industrial estates around the fringes of London that have some really beautiful buildings in them that get really overlooked. And this would have been just one small part of what would have been a huge West London industrial zone. Oh my God, there's someone's noisy motorbike over there. That stretched all the way around the, the western edge of London. We'll pick up the main part of that later on when we walk along the A4 Great West Road, London's Golden Mile. This really tells an important story in the development of London in the 20th century. And this would have been sort of like light industry and engineering, metal working, that kind of thing. Sort of manufacturing components for machines. There was a lot of cosmetics as well and chemical works. Now it's uh, mostly sort of storage, office spaces, studio spaces, quite a lot of automotive kind of places as well. Another lovely little bit of uh, art deco, modernism. I know I've tried to untangle those two words before and work out their relationship. I know they are related to each other and I know I often probably use them incorrectly, but... Love these houses here. This is a classic bit of kind of interwar 20s, 30s suburbia. Get a lot of this around um, West London, around the fringes. So we just got across the North Circular and we're into the wonderful Gunnersbury Park, a park with magnificent stories. And here we are in Gunnersbury Park, a really wonderful open space that Gordon S. Maxwell described in the 1920s as London's Wonderland. The name Gunnersbury is said to possibly derive from Gunnild or Gunnild's Manor. Gunnild being the niece of King Canute and the Danes held these lands until the Battle of Brentford in 1016 when they were defeated by Edmund Ironside. I mean, with a name like that, how could that guy ever lose a battle? Uh, well, he did, and the Danes ended up having to take a, a chunk of his kingdom. But you can see this is an area that goes back far into time, and it contains a really quite magnificent manor house with both royal connections and connections to some of the most important events in British history. The park here was formerly the grounds of Gunnersbury House, a really grand Georgian home that was built for Mad King George III's aunt, Princess Amelia. And it eventually passed into the ownership of various members of the Rothschilds family before it was handed over to the people in 1926 and opened as a public park and the house was also opened to the public. 
There's some old newsreel footage of Neville Chamberlain opening the park in 1926 and it was declared another lung for London. At that stage, Neville Chamberlain was the Minister for Health. But of course, he goes down in history as being the man who signed the appeasement agreement with Hitler in 1938. And of course, Chamberlain took off for that legendary meeting with Hitler from Heston Aerodrome, which is really nearby here, very close, only a couple of miles away. And that, first, that famous image of Neville Chamberlain standing on the steps of his aircraft, waving the piece of paper he'd signed with Hitler in his hand, thinking it had secured peace. That historic event took place right near this house, just a, a mile or two across the fields here. When I heard that fact about Chamberlain opening the house here in 1926, then returning back along the Great West Road to fly to Germany to sign that agreement with Hitler, I wondered whether he remembered that day in 1926 when he came here on a much more kind of happy occasion to open this grand park and the beautiful house. The poet and antiquarian Horace Walpole was summoned to Gunnersbury House by Princess Amelia to entertain her. It was also here that the Prince of Wales commissioned Walpole to write poetry for him. When it was owned by the Rothschild family, Benjamin Disraeli, Queen Victoria's Prime Minister, came here to ask the Rothschild's bank to uh, lend the government the money so the British government could invest in the Suez Canal. And it, when I came here, it was in May 2012, that's 10 years ago nearly now, the house was uh, looking a little bit tatty, the paint was peeling and parts of it were boarded up, which I rather quite liked given its former royal associations. I like the fact that it had become a slightly sort of tatty public utility. But it looks like now they've done a really magnificent restoration job on it, hasn't it? It looks, looks like, like a grand mansion and a palace once more. It was really quite a lovely warm May day when I came here. But the only other person set up on that veranda was just one bloke on his own drinking a can of strong lager. When you look down from that veranda, you get in the view that all those members of royalty and the politicians and the, the wealthiest people in Europe would have taken in, sat up on there drinking a cup of tea. Well, you can, you can get a tea or a coffee from the little van there and enjoy that view yourself. The, the 1881 census records 33 servants living and working here at Gunnersbury House. There was George Bundy, the head coachman, his wife and three children. There was William Cole, the coachman, who actually came from my hometown of, of High Wycombe. There was Fanny South, the domestic servant. Elizabeth Kilby, the kitchen maid, and Emily Duranda, one of three nurses. So it's not just the, the great and the good who are recorded in association with Gunnersbury House. It now houses uh, Ealing and Hounslow Museum. Uh, I'll have to go and see if it's open. was the Rothschild's dining room and the previous rooms were the long gallery which were their favourite rooms. There really is something magical about Gunnersbury Park. You can totally see why Maxwell called it London's Wonderland when he was writing in the 1920s. Actually which would have been around the time that it became a public space, a public park, and the house was open to the public. And they've done an incredible restoration job inside the house now, so it's all open to the public, all the floors and the Rothschild's um, rooms, and it's just really lovely. That was done with a Heritage Lottery grant in 2018. And so now we push on to the Great West Road, London's Golden Mile. 
and we'll be walking along the Great West Road, the A4, into the sunset. Love that. I love that stuff. This is such a great walk. We've just been back here. Oh, it's fantastic. I'd put Gunnersby Park in my top five parks, I think. This is one of the old lodge houses at the entrance to the park. It's actually going to be our exit onto the road. We're in for a bit of serious road walking now. Here we have the uh, Chiswick flyover, short section of the uh, M4 motorway that passes on this massive concrete structure here, which opened in 1959. I've travelled over the top of that on many occasions. And we're really close now to uh, the Brentford Community Stadium, which is the home of Brentford Football Club. But we're not going that way, we're going to plough along the road and battle with the traffic fumes. Here we have the, the European headquarters of, of Sega. That's why we've got Sonic the Hedgehog up there. I'm sure in the future people will see this as a very significant location. This is uh, Brentford's football ground here, the Brentford Community Stadium. They're having a really good season, aren't they, at the moment in the Premier League. And now we're going to be walking alongside the uh, A4 Great West Road which is built along the, the line of a, of a Roman road, the road that connected Newgate in the city of London to Aqua Sulis, the Roman city of Bath. But it's been suggested uh, by some eccentrics as being built along the a course of a ley line, but most likely an ancient trackway. This is Carville Hall. Quite a grand old house, isn't it? It's had the uh, A4 barge through its grounds, making it fairly redundant as a palatial country residence. There are a number of really quite grand houses along the A4 and the A40. I mean, we've just been to Gunnersbury Park. There's also Sion Park, which I think actually is still in private ownership. But there's Osterley Park, Chiswick Park, Boston Manor, a few others as well as you go west, all of which I think apart from Scion Park are now in public hands and have been in public hands since the 1920s, which is when this modernised version of the A4 Great West Road was built. So it's interesting that the displacement of the wealthy and the aristocracy from this part of London was nothing to do with politics or revolutionary zeal, it was to do with the building of a road, which in itself actually had a kind of progressive um, bent behind it, a, a drive to give access to the countryside for the people of the city, to bring the green space closer to the people living in the polluted city. I mean, obviously, <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way. As you can imagine, my beloved Gordon S. Maxwell, author of The Fringe of London and Just Beyond, Beyond London, a great topographical rambler of the London suburbs, he hated the a4 road, the modern A4 road, he wrote that this arterial horror sears the face of rural Middlesex. Maxwell thought that the drivers on the roads who, who uh, kill people in accidents should be treated in the manner of the highwaymen which once haunted the Great West Road. And of course they were hung, drawn and quartered and hung for gibbets along the roadside to deter future highwaymen and footpads. It's a bit extreme, I <laughs> But actually, even the assistant commissioner for Scotland Yard in the 1940s, the wonderful named um, H. Alka Tripp, I think his name was, he said that the death rates on London's roads had reached battle level. Battle level. Now, he's saying that in the 1940s, during the Second World War. So it was a serious problem. So this new development here with wonderful views of the Chiswick flyover has only been built when I came through here in 2012 but it's built around one of the great architectural gems of the Great West Road. So this is Wallace House designed by Wallace Gilbert and Partners 
who designed a lot of the notable Art Deco buildings along the Great West Road in the 1920s and 1930s. This was originally built for a company called Simmons Accessories. Wallace and Partners are best known for uh, designing the Hoover Building, the majestic Hoover Building over on the A40 on the Western Avenue. It's a really sleek and stylish form of architecture, isn't it? And basically what it did is it transformed this strip of factories into a, a kind of like a sunset strip for Art Deco architecture. These weren't just merely places of work, these were artworks. I'm pretty sure these buildings here next to Wallace House weren't built when I came 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure there was like an old industrial unit here that's obviously been demolished and replaced with this Novotel. So in the 1920s and 30s, this road here became a line of these new Art Deco factories lined up against the Great West Road that contained a number of really big companies, mostly producing consumer goods. So you had Smith's Crisps, you had uh, Gillette Razors, Beecham's Pharmaceuticals, Firestone Tires, Curry's Electricals and Coty Cosmetics. And there was a neon um, Lucozade bottle tipping out the Lucozade into a glass. That was uh, in some threat. It was turned off, I think. Uh, I don't know what I'll, put, I'll find out when that year was. And it had been removed. I think uh, it's in a museum somewhere. There was a point where it was just going to be trashed. But these Art Deco buildings were illuminated with neon, giving it that feel of the coming electrical age. It's kind of almost like the hub of 20th century consumerism here on the Great Rest Road going out through Brentford. This has all been built since I was last here, 10 years ago. There was a company along here called the Sperry Gyroscope Company and I read a letter in the local paper about a gentleman who'd worked there during the war and he said they're engaged in top secret military work during the Second World War. And actually what they did is they engineered the cogwheels that went into the Enigma machine that broke the Enigma code, Alan Turing and all that, the first computers. There's that wonderful film, The Imitation Game, with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch who plays Alan Turing. And the components for that machine that is believed to have uh, shortened the war by two years. The components were manufactured along the Great West Road here. So it's a street of many stories and many secrets including this little road behind me called Brook Lane North. So this uh, street here, Brook Lane, was used as a location in an Ealing comedy called The Rainbow Jacket, which is a really early Sid James comedy. And they put down a, a prop, a post box here. They used for filming, of course it was here for a day or two, during which time residents started posting their letters in it. So when they finished the filming, they picked up the letterbox and had to go and post the letters to the post office. I love little stories like that. And Ealing used a number of locations around here in their films, as did Doctor Who. So lots of episodes of Doctor Who, or the early Doctor Who before it moved out to Wales, that was shot all around kind of like the, uh, the A4 and the A40. I shall have to look up the brook, which gives Brook Lane its name. It's obviously running underground now. It can't be the Stamford Brook, I don't think, because this is too far west, but it'll be interesting to see which brook it is. Another lost river to add to our list. This is the bare bones of a new building going up right next to the road. Given what we know about the really harmful effects of road pollution and the air quality that it produces, I'm really surprised that they can still build right next to a really busy road like this. Kind of incredible, isn't it? You would think that we wouldn't go anywhere near these roads for habitation anymore, but it doesn't seem to be stopping us. This uh, block of flats here was built on the site of what was the New England Bar and Restaurant when I came past in 2012. You can still see, look, they've still got the, uh, the skeleton of the pub sign there. Which I remember someone telling me that as long as that's there, it means it can revert to a licensed premises. I don't know if that's true or not. And you can see this is the point here where the M4 goes off on its own route 
leaves the uh, A4 Great West Road to itself, to its own devices. And here we can see at least one of the original industrial investors in the Great West Road is still here, Beecham's Pharmaceuticals, obviously now GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals. I don't know if this is the original site of their, um, of their first factory here, but they're still here on the A4. It's interesting, although we are firmly in Greater London, I'm not sure whether we're in London Borough of Ealing or Hounslow, I think we're sort of just crossed over the border, I think, into Hounslow. But um, I do remember that Brentford, people would always write their addresses, Brentford Middlesex, abbreviated to M-I-D-D-X. Do people still do that? Because obviously <laughs> Middlesex as an administrative body doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. They did away with it in 1965. But I do remember seeing that written down. I mean, maybe you can let me know in the comments if you live in this area or got relatives in this area or friends. They still write. Brentford Middlesex. Does Middlesex live on? We're just crossing over the uh, Grand Union Canal here, which at this stage is conjoined with the uh, River Brent. And I walked along here when I did the Capital Ring, March 2020. I think I did that February or March 2020, before, uh, before the world changed. That's a really great walk. That building there has got a kind of space age feel to it, hasn't it? I can't remember what sort of film that reminds me of, like Outland or something like that. An 80s vision of the future. Here's one of the surviving Art Deco buildings here. This is a real beauty, isn't it? Now, JC Deco, but I'll have to look up what it was originally. Next door is another Art Deco survivor. It's now fully serviced offices. Quite nice to have an office in there. Although the neon is gone that led to this being called the Golden Mile, there's still something majestic about it with these surviving Art Deco buildings. And actually also some of the great big glass buildings as well give it a kind of still that feel of activity and majesty and all the industry that's going on here and all the activity. It's still a special place, the Great West Road. Look at this beauty here, Scion Clinic now. It's a real Art Deco stunner, isn't it? So the Gillette building here on Gillette Corner marks the end of the Golden Mile and it also marks the end of our walk today. This is the last of the kind of great Art Deco masterpieces of the Great West Road built by uh, an architect called Bannister. I'll put his full name on the, on the screen here, but it was the European headquarters of the Gillette Corporation of Boston, Massachusetts. A really grand building, the clock tower there, being that it sits on a high point on the road was a real landmark, but it's usually lit up, but it's not lit up at the moment, so clearly the building is, uh, I don't know what's happened. It's interesting, because in 2012 when I came past here, this was in the process of being converted into a luxury hotel, but otherwise it was a place that urbexers were breaking into and exploring and trying to get up that tower. So I don't know what happened to that development. I guess it never took place, because you can see, look, it's all sort of covered up with wire mesh around the perimeter. Well, thank you so much for joining me on that walk back to the beginnings of my book, This Other London, which you can buy, still available to buy. And actually, if you buy it from the New and Bookshop, I'll put a link below, I'll sign it for you. It may take a little bit longer to get it out to you, but uh, yeah, I'll write a little message in there for you as well, if you let Vivian know what you want me to write in there. Anyway, um, it's really special for me to come back 
and do this after yeah nine and a half years nearly 10 years and to see the changes that have taken place even in that relatively short space of time but it's also nice to see the things that have stayed the same and it tells so many stories in such a relatively short you know section of the walk the walk in the book carries on up here up wick lane to wick green scion lane sorry to wick green then over rossley park through heston lampton and out to hounslow heath so we'll pick that walk up i think it would be nice to finish it i'd really like to take you to wick green and ostley park and those places and heston we should go to heston aerodrome shouldn't we so still loads to explore out here on the western fringe but for today for me, it's all about, you know, Gunnersbury House, Gunnersbury Park and the Golden Mile. What an evocative landscape. Anyway, take care, stay safe. And as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be.